Hey everybody, welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm Jordan Edwards. I'm Demi Ramos. And today on the show, we've got two feet. There are so many things to say about two feet, um, but today I think we are going to know a little bit more about Bill at the end of this podcast because we all know two feet has crazy numbers. He's toured all over the world with some of your favorite bands. He is, you know, this viral mystery. Um, and I think today what the fans want to hear is a lot more about Bill, the person. So we're going to go there. When I was looking up interviews on YouTube to see what he's been like on camera, he's kind of reserved. He's kind of a quiet guy. 100%. He doesn't like to go in depth too much. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what he says. Bill plays he is two feet but he does have two bandmates one of which he's had for from the beginning which is my homie jeffrey um super talented dj um shout out he he has his own dj project called we're dying the dopest but he plays pads for two feet and recently they actually just added a third band member so they are now a trio um aside from i believe bill writes all the music himself but when they play live, there is a trio. So I know Jeffrey, and that's how I met Bill a few years ago. But in fact, Bill has played DIY shows all over Bushwick and Brooklyn. If you're not familiar with Two Feet's music, you're surely familiar with his biggest hit, I uh, Feel Like I'm Drowning. It was, it has bajillion streams. It's been on multiple TV shows. It's one of those Viral. songs that even if you don't know the name of it, you know it, you've heard it on something. Absolutely. So I always like to hear the story behind their most famous song. Mm -hmm. So I'll be interested to hear about how he put together Feel Like I'm Drowning and how that's changed his life. Because <clears throat> you get that one big song, it changes your life. Which Absolutely. makes me wonder, Demi, have you written that one big song and we just haven't heard it yet? Ooh, Jordan, we're, you know, we'll find out. Time will tell. But project coming up, ta-ta. <laughs> Ta -ta. <laughs> just i've never done that before. i know i like i like it actually jordan i like where do, i i also <laughs> want to know where this idea where you say my name in a british accent honestly i ever since we interviewed gracie oh because she's british she was like jordan yeah. i'll never forget even you can go back to that podcast she's like you're like gracie hello like welcome to it's you know it's real with jordan she's like hello jordan and i was like i almost died. i'm gonna i'm gonna isolate that clip yeah. and i'm gonna put it on as my ringtone or something <sighs> yeah. honestly if she said my name i would have to do the same thing here's what i love about two feet is that Rock music in terms of its popularity and cultural impact isn't as mm -hmm. great as it was 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely. But Bill can really shred on the guitar. Like he's really got some cool guitar parts in an era where even a rock song often won't have a guitar solo, won't have a really cool guitar part. So Bill is also homies with blue to tiger and there's this really interesting thing coming out of new york like i'm pretty sure i saw them do like a dj i hope they both once. stay here they have you know? done a yes i believe there was one time about two three years ago they did a dual um dj set he was on guitar she was on bass and there's this there's this thing coming is out there of a video york. evidence of this oh my god i'm sure if we dug we could find something but there's this thing coming out of New York City right now where DJs are bringing on a trumpet player, um, a saxophone guy, a guitar, a bass, and they're they're doing this like this this collab um, live, and it's bringing electronic music and the concept of an ensemble, and, and, and it's you know genre bending in a way that's so harmonious and beautiful. Right. And it's coming out of New York City. I've, I'm seeing this all over the place. So this is, you know. We'll right. see what's gonna happen. What's up, guys? Hello. Hello. Hey, Bill. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. <laughs> see, you're in the studio there. You got your studio yeah. set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always. Okay. So, just a heads up, Bill, um, Jordan, and I. First of all, welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. Um, Jordan and I are going to give you a real hard time today because <laughs> you are a true New Yorker that has moved to LA and has abandoned your city. So tell us about how is LA going? Oh my right God. Now? <laughs> um, 
why don't you, yeah, why don't you attack him right out of the gate? <laughs> yeah. Um, pretty, uh, honestly, pretty bad. I mean, it's not like, it's not much better than New York. Um, everything's closed. You can't go inside. Um, wow. Yeah, honestly, I, I, I was back in New York like a week, a uh, couple, two weeks ago, and it was more fun than L.A. because like parts of like downtown and like the village and like Williamsburg and shit kind of feel like have like a Mardi Gras vibe with people. Um, New York like, is all popping. The, yeah, and all the bars they, on the mm -hmm. street and everything like that. And here there's none of that at all. So I would say it's probably a little bit more fun in New York right now. Yeah, for for those for those of you not living in New York, haven't visited New York. In New York, they've a lot of restaurants have added outdoor seating that extend onto the sidewalk, so it have, almost has like a Parisian sidewalk cafe feel wherever you're walking around, and and kind of a Mardi Gras vibe too. So, yeah, exactly. And uh, there's there's none of that here. It's all like driving, and everything's closed on the inside. And uh, yeah, like I said, New York is doing better right now than uh, LA is. So. I was planning on coming here for like a year before this happened. It just kind of like lined so up. So the band it. has moved into this <laughs> wondrous um, music making situation right now. Yeah. And you guys, I assume, are just vomiting music out left and right. Making vomiting, bobble yeah. my hope. Yeah, yeah. Tons of different stuff all the time. It's easier having Huff in the house too to help me like kind of as you can see, set up the audio. <laughs> yeah. I almost cried when I saw him. Jeffrey used to live like a few blocks away and I used to literally be there every single day for no reason. So yeah, it was cool to see Jeffrey. I haven't seen him. You guys have known each other for years, right? Well, that's how I met you. I was saying basically to Jordan earlier, um, Two Feet is this viral mystery, rock meets electronic sensation, right? But I think what the fans really want to know right now is a little bit more about Bill, the man behind the music. So who are you, Bill? Who are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm just a, a New Yorker uh, who uh, was making beats for a while for kids around my neighborhood and then uh, decided to make stuff for myself and it took up online. Um, who am I? I don't know. <laughs> you started out. Let's go to that. You started out producing be other people's music before you made your own two feet music, right? Yeah, um, I, uh, I I would produce like for kids. I, I lived in on like a like 110th in Columbus, basically. So I would just produce beats for kids around me. I had like a different day job as like a cashier, and I would also just make beats for anybody who asked and sell them for like 200 bucks, whatever. I, you know, I had some like minor contact with like. Warner um, publishing and would produce beats for some songwriters and, and records for songwriters over there and stuff like that all before my project started. And then I started to make my own music and um, that's how that kind of rolled from there, so. That's insane. I remember a few years ago, um, me and Jeffrey were at this bar and I, I honestly, tell me if I'm wrong, but you, you said something like, yeah, so I just got really lit and then, it was just like really late. So I just threw a song up on SoundCloud and it just went viral. Is this true? Is this a true story? Are you that's, being a little modest? Yes, no. are you being modest? No, that's actually literally what happened. Uh, you know, I know kids who they, there's a similar stuff, they have a similar story, you know, they're like, oh, I posted something on SoundCloud and it went viral. But in reality, they had, you know, three years of a team behind them and they waited when the perfect time to release the music and they had management before any music was out and they had a development team, et cetera, et cetera, pushing it before it. This was not that at all. Uh, I literally just put it online and it somehow went completely viral. And uh, yeah, I was kind of shocked and Brilliant. found management afterwards and, and uh, support afterwards and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah, I mean, that, that's straight. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. <laughs> sick yeah. and your, your biggest hit so far in terms of chart success and and airplay is uh feel like it feels like i'm drowning but your first big hit when you talk we were talking about was go fuck yourself uh -huh. tell me about how that changed your life how your life evolved in the months after you posted that song okay so yeah that's actually like kind of an inter an interesting story um you know, it didn't actually, it took off on SoundCloud right away, right? So it started going viral on SoundCloud and then it kind of just had separate individual spurts. Like, go fuck yourself, took off on SoundCloud, 
then it kind of stopped getting plays and I was like, okay, I guess that's it. Cool. At least I got, you know, I got signed from it. I got a nice start to my career. And then it took off again on YouTube when Trap Nation uploaded it. Then it died down again. And then finally it really took off on uh, Spotify. Went viral on Spotify. And then Did you get TikTok put on playlists? Too. Cause that's a big thing on Spotify. Is yeah. So I have one of the go fuck yourselves is one of the biggest songs. Um, to go without really ever being playlisted. So most of my music, which is kind of interesting, I don't rely on Spotify playlists to get plays. I have you know, 5.5 million monthly listeners and like 90% of that's user generated playlists and stuff, not from uh, Spotify playlists and stuff like that. Right. Which is kind of, yeah, it's just sort of lucky, you know? <laughs> and before the fans come after me, it's not feels like I'm drowning. It's I feel like I'm drowning. I want to get. Yeah, but people say I, they call it drowning too. They call it anything. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, that's good. that's. I think that's a sign of you've got a really freaking famous song yeah. when people have kind of evolved the name of it. You know. Uh, yeah. And they, given it different names. Yeah. Totally. Sometimes it's just the initials too. You know. Wow. Like you so. know you got a big song when they, it's got initials. You know. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. that one was different though. That wasn't the internet. That was. Uh, radio that one actually worked on radio so you know I had and that a, was uh, after you'd signed to Republic right yep yep yeah so um, that was kind of your big like your big label song so to that speak. was a yeah that was a label song the label push song yep mm -hmm. and then um so you know I had the internet song and I had a radio song and that kind of just helped round out the whole rest of the career um tie that in with touring and stuff and that's kind of been the past like you know three four years with everything together can you name every show that and placement that i feel like i'm drowning has been on can you name the shows <laughs> no i can't I, there's been a lot i mean uh more famous ones it's been in like uh control z this uh, really big mexican show it's been in um that show with jennifer aniston it's in like one of the final episodes the morning uh, show the yeah. morning show yeah a couple of tv and i think and, it was it was on uh uh, Good Girls, the uh, the the uh, uh, Christina Hendricks show. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they uh, people were seem to really like to use that song a lot, so for syncs and stuff like that. And you're like, I will take those checks. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were a you majored in music, and was it jazz? What did you major in high? Uh, was it college? College? Yes. Uh, well, I didn't really go, but I you went. went to Berkeley for like. Tell five us about minutes, that. Right? That's the yeah. Story. yeah. Yeah, I went to Berkeley for um, one semester, but I really only went for like four weeks of the one semester. And I went for, uh, yeah, performance and um, just like jazz guitar playing and stuff, yeah. We were just talking about your guitar playing and how it's rare these days, you know, rock music has become more electronic sounding over the last several years. Um, yeah. a, a lot of it because your people or rock bands are using pad drummers instead of kit drummers and it's easier to give give it that sound but you regardless of the song you've always maintained room for your guitar to yeah. noodle noodle is a bad word let me reverse that you, you can always, say noodle it's noodling, okay. noodling. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like you're in a jam band with, with yeah. like you're in a fish cover band no right you you always give you give give your guitar room to play a solo you you kind of have this cool bb king inspired blues style so right. tell me about you know your guitar playing and and what sounds you go for when you're when you're writing your songs well um you know initially i just really liked um the way that like heavy heavy bass and electronic like dubstep sound sounded with guitar i just felt like i kept tr trying to make like uh, future bass music i guess kind of at first where i would have like the sharp bass and then like a super soft synth or something but it just started sounding so corny to me. So I started just putting my guitar in and that's simply how like the sound came about, um, honestly. And then um, when it comes to the live show, when you're asking about why the live show, um, cause if you watch clips on YouTube and everything, you know, the solos are sometimes three, four minutes long, whatever. Right. Um, yeah, so the reasoning behind that, which is now part of a, you know, the signature part of our live show um, is because when Huff and I first started playing together, um, I only had like four songs. And when you played those four songs back to back with no guitar solos in them, 
it was like a 12 minute set it's yeah minute yeah, it was, yeah it was like a 12 to 16 minute set and we were opening for this french artist named jane on like a 20 date north american tour and we played the first show and her to- her tour manager came up to us after and was like you know what the fuck was that you guys <laughs> you, you guys ended like 15 minutes early what you can't do that yeah you can't do that and he got like extremely pissed and was like you can't ever do that again whatever etc mm-hmm. so we started freaking out going like what are we going to do so we decided to just extend the extend the songs and just put a solo in where vocals would normally be <laughs> and that's kind of how the live show developed into that into like the whole routine we have and you know that then made its own fan base for it because um you know a lot of my live audience is different than the people who stream me even they're like you know they're select they they come to see like a jam band kind of honestly so that's kind of how that started just accidentally in a way just because uh, i needed to fill up time for a live show yeah Yeah. well i think it's i think it's a good career move not like i not like i'm some like music industry expert but i think it's a good career move because it kind of reminds me of someone like jack white for example who you think about white stripes have songs that people know the lyrics to people sing along to, but then he's also known as this really good guitar player. So right. by doing that, you're kind of giving yourself like a dual career in a way as like the right. songwriter person and then the guitar player person. Right. Exactly. I mean, we have different publications from, you know, guitar world, guitar mag, rolling stone, yeah. whatever, reaching out about just the guitar playing as opposed to even the music, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. So yeah, it definitely breaks it up into two different worlds and, you know, there's jazz, like, you know, so you see it in the live shows, like we have kids come to our shows with like tool shirts on or fish shirts on and stuff like that, where they like, yeah. like math rock and jam bands. And then there's, you know, the other kids, you know, uh, who, are, who are obviously just there because they like, you know, the radio hits. and, and The bass. Like, you know, yeah, and the bass and stuff like yeah. that. So it's like this really kind of cool mix of people. Um, but yeah, you definitely see both worlds at the show because of exactly what you said. Yeah. And you coming from, you know, I know you didn't graduate from Berkeley, but Berkeley's like a really like music nerd school. And, Mm. and so it's gotta be fun (laughs) for you to play these shows and to have this opportunity to, to really shred on the guitar rather than just play, you know, I feel like I'm drowning. Okay, here it goes. You can really elaborate with your live set. Yeah. It makes them way more interesting for me and i think for the audience uh too especially now since the crowds who we you know the, the people who come to my show know what they're going to go see so right. yeah it, it definitely makes it way more interesting you can open up way way more um you know we do everything a little different each time so you know there's some people who if a if a show is close enough to each other they'll come to like three in a row and they're like different each night you know what mm. i mean because it's not like the same set thing so yeah, yeah. 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 You'll be doing like those, those fish live albums where they would do like six nights in MSG and have right. like a live album for each night, you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Cause they're all, they're all different each night. So kind of, right. I mean, it also makes it a little uh, less professional to some people because um, you know, the reason people have like these big, let's say you're playing like an arena show, like we went on tour with panic of the disco, you know? Oh my God. And can you tell the, us about that? Yeah, I will. Well, so part of it um, is, you know, um, the, every show is 20,000 people, whatever. So they have this huge production, right? So every single night, and don't get me wrong, I really, I, I love, I love them. I, you know, Brendan is cool and everything, but, and, and everyone does this, is every single night, every single part of the show was exactly the same. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like even from even the, sometimes he would diverge on his like, you know, things he said to the audience, but usually they were pretty much exactly the same. Well, they're such um, a theatrical band. Right. Yeah. They're so theatrical. So everything's so in place, but you know, all big bands who are touring arenas are basically doing that same thing. Cause you have to, right. Because otherwise, you know, they get nervous. Like what if they go off and then something screws up and the timing gets off and everything like production that. Production is so large. Right. Yeah. It has to be planned. Exactly. So there's that. So we don't do that. So as we scale up, it is a little bit more difficult to have shows that are more programmed, if you know what I mean. Like, um, but there's, there's definitely obviously workarounds for it. As you said, Fish does MSG, you know, five nights in a row and yeah. you know, they have it different. But logistically, it is a little bit more challenging than if you were to do the same exact thing every night. And as I said, there's an obvious reason for that, just to keep things simple and, you know, uh, make sure everything flows like, kind of the machine it has to on one of those big tours, you know? 
as you've gotten more famous, as the band's gotten more famous, as your music has become more well known, how do you feel about the, you know, the grip of managers of the label of publicists kind of tightening around you a little bit? Do you, do you feel trapped a little bit sometimes in terms of what you're able to do? I did in the beginning, um, you know, I've had now like four man different management teams. Um, I don't know how to put this. Other wow. than that. Do, you, do you yell, do you fire people all the time? You're like, you're fired. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I fire people all the time. I, I don't let, um, I have a kind of, I have a good, I don't know, way to, I just know how to run what I want to run. And if someone's trying to push me around or tries to get me to do something, you know, I just don't let them. And I, you know, I, like I said, I've had four different managers. Um, you know, I've swapped around a ton of different people. You know, there's a lot of artists out there who just because they want to accept certain opportunities, let people take advantage of them let people make money off them, get these 360 deals where they're making none of the money, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't let that happen. You know, I make That's sure. Boss. If, yeah. I make sure if there's money being made that I'm the one who's making most of it. Um, and that's actually sort of, you know, been the reason why I've had to swap people out and stuff like that. Um, and you know, yeah, I don't let anyone control me. You know, I did in the beginning and it kind of threw me off in my head, you know, like, telling you what to wear when you go on the shows and stuff like that. And it's, yeah, I just, I kind of stopped that about two years ago and I've just been feeling much better with my career and things have finally been like kind of flown the way I want to. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for the next 12 to 16 months. You know what I mean? I got everyone kind of on the same page and doing the same thing and, you know, listening to me as the fucking CEO of my own little company here and that's the way to do it. You have some very special bandmates, one of which is my yeah. very close friend, Jeffrey. Shout out to Jeffrey and his solo project, mm -hmm. We're Dying. He is yeah. a very talented DJ and producer. Um, but tell us more about your bandmates and how two became three. And how did you get, how did you turn the songs into a live performance? Right. So I couldn't have done that without Jeff. I call him <laughs> Huff. Everyone, uh, that's kind of his music industry name. Uh, I met him, so this is a funny story. I was still, I had no, I didn't get any music forwards. I, I hadn't gotten any publishing money yet. Nothing had been played on the radio. It had just been on, go fuck yourself, it had been on SoundCloud, which obviously you make no money from. So at the time I was living in an apartment that was probably a little bit, tiny bit bigger than this room. It was a small studio apartment. Um, and when Huff first met me, he, he came over to my apartment. I, I knew him through a mutual friend. And uh, he came over to my apartment and walks in and he just sees like holes in the wall and like mm -hmm. rat traps on the kitchen counter and stuff. <laughs> and he actually looks at me and he goes, is this an actual job? Like, do you actually like, need me to do something? Like, is, is this like, are we actually going to go on tour? So I was like, yeah, I promise we are. I know this looks a little fucked up, but like, I promise. So I gave him the music. I gave him the stems. I had no idea how to create a live show. And um, we kind of learned together over the course of a year, two years, and we built out the slideshow and, you know, it went from having, you know, four outputs to 30 something outputs. And, and it's slowly kind of turning into this mock monster, with, you know, our new lighting guy, our new production guy, or, you know, a, you know, a music, musical director, et cetera, et cetera. And we keep building it out. And every time we go on tour, we up the production value, we up everything. But yeah, I couldn't have done anything without uh, Huff. He's uh, super, super talented. And, um, then the next the newest member, as you said, Demi, uh, is a guy named Swain. And um, Swain. yeah, that was all Huff too. I didn't really want a drummer as, um, as you were saying, like, you know, everyone uses pads, you know, stuff like that to get the mm -hmm. electronic sound. So I, I wanted to keep it that way. I came from electronic music. I didn't want to branch out, but Huff uh, kind of convinced me, you know, hey, we should get a drummer to really kind of build out the sound. So we found Swain together. And then over the course of two to three months, Huff did like a bunch of rehearsals with him and caught him caught up on all the music and kind of put that whole aspect of it together. And it added like a huge brand new dimension to everything. Are the guys helping you write and record music now or is it strictly just kind of a live show relationship? So um, Huff helps, um, he helps, helps set up my studio. He's, he's like my engineer. 
Um, he'll help with some sound design sometimes and some mixing notes and stuff. But when it comes to like writing, you know, melodies, lyrics, chord progressions, uh, et cetera, I still do that just by myself. But um, I would definitely say Huff is super integral, uh, increasingly so, to my writing process. And on the next album, he's got a couple of credits here and there and stuff like that. So yeah, he, he definitely does that. Also Swain, um, I'm starting to use his live drums and some of the music more and stuff like that too. So yeah, I'd say increasingly as time goes on, they're both getting more involved in actually helping to create the songs and stuff cool, like that. Cool, cool. Yeah. Your, your latest album, you released, your latest album, Pink, is out now. And you released that right before quarantine, right? Or it came out. Uh, I released it the day, March 13th, Friday the 13th, the day the whole country locked down, the wow. day Trump made that huge speech. Uh, How rough is that for you? Really <laughs> rough, honestly. Like I had a, I had a billboard in Times Square mm. and nobody was there. Nobody well, was, I, so. I remember you posting that on your Instagram account. Yeah. And it was up long enough to where there were people walking by the billboard in the photo. So that must have, there must have been this really tiny window between the billboard being up and the shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it's crazy. Uh, well, he just uh, needs yeah. to make another album for another billboard. I, That's all. Yeah. No, Good. I know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's already done, actually. So you just have to wait. But um, yeah, that was really, really disappointing, man. I can't, I can't, ex and, you know. So you never was, got a chance to see your billboard, your own. I never billboard. got to see it. You know, you wait forever so to you get. had someone else take that photo of the billboard and send it to you yeah well wow. weirdly enough um i was i was actually in chicago flying back so i couldn't see it anyway we had a show that was canceled on thursday which is going to be the celebratory show you know the albums out at midnight etc cetera, etc cetera. right and uh yeah i never got to see it um i had to come back and then when i came back you know my dad was freaking out about me being in the city and he was like hey you know you should come home or rent a place up in like Long Island or something and just like go like, you know, it, you know how, pa remember how panicked everyone was yes. in the beginning? Yes. Like sure, everyone was sure. like, we're going to, everyone's going to die. Everyone was at the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah, honestly, the day the album came out, I was driving out to Long Island. Like <laughs> could not even get like, yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, horrible. So I was telling Jordan earlier that you are also, you've done DJ sets with blue i think yeah. um at blue this tiger. like underground yes blue to tiger and if i remember correctly i think it was the end of festival season of last year and the guys show up to this super low-key basement show now i'm talking i'm pretty sure you've played like Lollapalooza for like a gazillion people they come through to this basement show in the middle of bushwick okay all oh, right I and <laughs> i swear there was probably 30 people max yeah. and you can literally you would have seen a two feet show in a basement and um in the middle of New York City and no one knew about it and it was super low key and I just give you props for that because you're doing this clearly because I feel like I really missed out. Life. I missed yeah, out. Man. I, I think you did. Yeah. I, I it was a uh, Tiger DJ live yeah, show. Absolutely. It was a two feet set though actually. Yeah, oh, it was. We played yes. the actual stuff through like, you know, the crummy little sound system and my friend Graydon had to like ride the amp behind us <laughs> to make sure you could kind of hear the guitar and stuff. But yeah, Debbie, yeah, we love doing stuff like that. I wish I could do that more. Um, you know, normally there's no, I can't advertise it because I have like a booking agent and everything like that. And a million people, like you were saying before, would like try to get, I mean, like, hey, are you getting paid for this? You know, like where's our uh -huh, percentage, uh -huh. whatever. But yeah, so we used to do that all the time. And um, actually uh, Blue and I and Huff have played together on like rooftops. Demi, I don't know if you remember, it was like maybe two or three years ago even. Mm -hmm. And we were on Sam Blumen's rooftop. And do um, you remember this? It was in Bushwick. And I remember a flyer for this. Yeah. And, and at that point, flyer. you guys were playing huge flyer, yeah. stages, too. This is what yeah. I'm trying to say. It's, it's blows, it blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. And then we, we, both. we played on the roof. Yeah, exactly. And we were just jamming on the roof. And then Blue shows up at her base. Mm -hmm. And this is way before, you know, TikTok or anything like that. And started just mm -hmm. playing with us too, and you know we did that at least two to three times with her. Can we find her footage of this? I have no clue. I mean, probably <sighs> someone probably has something of it somewhere. Like yeah, it some will. Light. It will come up. 
Facebook memory or Instagram memory or something like that from years ago. But yeah, that, that was really uh, fun. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that was a different time, you know, the New York scene was a little different too. How do you feel about the whole idea of New York, people staying in New York and New York quote unquote scene versus moving to LA because the industry is more based there? Um, LA has way less of a vibe. I don't, you know what I mean? There's way just less vibes. I'm actually personally having kind of a tough time here. Like, it's just like, I had to get a car and to get, you know what I mean? Like I had to. You have a driver's drive. license? Yeah. You're yeah. a New York guy. So did, did you what? actually grow up driving at all? No. So I, well, so I had to get an, I have a Los Angeles, uh, California driver's license. Now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a traitor. Yeah, I know. But, um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know. I look, I will say, you know, there, there are a ton more opportunities here for music, uh, fashion, anything entertainment, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's kind of everywhere you go. That's what everyone's doing. Um, but you know, now that I'm here and I've seen it, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I've lived here for a little bit now and everything like that. You can do all the same stuff in New York. It's just, there's less, like, if you really are about going out, meeting people, if you, if that's really important to your creative process or to your career, then yeah, LA would be a more expedient city to get further and get farther ahead. But, you know, for me, I produce from my bedroom mostly. I don't really take collaborations. I don't really go out and do too many sessions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's kind of no real additional reason for me to be here. You know, my grandma's in New York, my she lives in Harlem, my dad's in New York, my sisters, both my sisters, you know what I mean? So, um, and even if you were doing TV stuff, most like talk, sh- a lot of talk shows are still filmed in New York. Yep, yep, yeah. yep, they are. Yeah, tons of televisions in New York still. I think this is mostly music and film, is obviously mostly out here, but you know, like I'm trying to say, it's really not a necessity to be in Los Angeles to get those things done. It's just like, if that's what you want to do, if that's how you want to conduct yourself and run your career, it might be a little bit easier if you're, you know, a networking person, if you're somebody who needs to go into sessions, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. The entertainment industry is crazy. As you know, it can take a toll sometimes on your personal life. Um, What other than the music keeps you grounded? Uh, my dog. You never <laughs> met her yet, Demi, but... Uh, Can we talk about her, please? Yeah, sure. So I got her actually in the most musician way, <laughs> uh, which is like, it sounds like the stupidest sentence I ever said, but it's true. So we were playing a music festival in Delaware called Firefly. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, like I have. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Big, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cool festival. And so in the artist area, like in the backstage, they had this um, little tent where they brought puppies from like a nearby shelter. Wow. Yeah, so I w- was playing with the puppies like before the show and um, my dog, she just kept coming over and sitting on my lap and she was had super pretty eyes and like everything like that. And I don't know, all of a sudden I was just like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get this dog. So I just walked over and I was like, how much for the dog? Like, they're like, well, you just have to donate to this and et cetera and whatever and, and go get her the shots and everything, so I did. And, you know, we played this, we played the show. I, I kept her in the green room and I just, you know, picked her up and we drove back home from Delaware that night and I had a new little puppy. So it's, it's kind so of you crazy. toured with Madonna. Yeah, briefly. Yeah. She was uh, on the road. Yeah. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. Now it's been like a year and a half since I've had her. Does she like she, the road? Yeah, she does. She likes, she likes anybody and anything. And she's like did the friendliest. Did she, meet, did she meet Madonna? No, they were playing meet- Madonna when i adopted her they were playing like oh. like a virgin or something like because they had like music playing like to try to get people to like go in and everything and but, why like, madonna Where because that that's from? why because they were playing her music they're playing uh the madonna a madonna song like literally See, I, as I, I decided I, I to understood madonna. you bill i thought you were actually touring with the madonna no 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 yeah i was confused for a second. <laughs> yeah it confuses people a lot i like tweet things about her i'll be like madonna like made friends with a cat today <laughs> some speaking people, of madonna people will be like what the fuck you should get her like that like madonna wore that like rhinestone that crystal eye patch for a while oh one. right yeah i know get one for her for halloween or something yeah 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 like <laughs> speaking of madonna, madonna what is the deal bill with you and britney spears oh i, <laughs> <laughs> I love britney spears i've loved her since i was a little kid um 
just like I don't know Toxic is one of my all-time favorite songs and how many um, Britney Spears shirts do you own like four or five probably wow <laughs> yeah I like wearing them at shows and stuff um I feel like you going on a date with Britney Spears isn't out of the question I, I, like I know well I think she's kind of like <laughs> I hope she's doing like I, I honestly like I don't know if you've seen the stuff about her but yeah um, what's up yeah I, she's like locked she's in this like horrible conservative church conservatorship with her father it's like yeah. this whole big like abusive thing with her and her family they kind of control everything and every aspect of her and uh yeah i don't know it's just like i'm a huge britney spears fan and uh yeah it's it's like really it's kind of sad you know i i it, every, it's kind of no one really fully knows what's going on with her in her personal life but um you know there's a lot of questions about it and it's it's sort of uh, super troubling um but i don't know we'll see i just hope she's okay you know you should yeah. like i don't know if you go google it if you want to look into it it's pretty crazy though let's uh shift gears a little bit bill yeah. and talk about your music um you're in the studio with your bandmates even though pink has only been out for a few months you're already working on the next album so i know you're not going to give us you know full details about it but can you tell us a little bit about the sound of that album what the songs are like the what, what kind of what can people expect yeah so um i guess this would actually be the first time i talked about it exclusive no. yeah exclusive demi you got the exclusive um <laughs> um yeah so actually to be honest i finished it um i was so angry um about that the coverage for um my last album was completely covered up and you know um the first like two months sales were not that great now actually pink the album sales are starting to pick up finally because you know you know finally people are going back and listening Dude, I, you know I've, I've i've talked this um before and i've discussed this with demi is that still to this day even with the internet appearing on TV shows and radio shows is so helpful with getting your music out to the cultural zeitgeist with getting oh, yeah, people yeah. familiar. I mean, if you can go on, you know, even if you can go on James Corden or Jimmy Fallon, that's, that's still really helpful because not only you're getting the audience who's watching on TV, the video goes on YouTube the next day and, right. you know, and exactly you're not getting no. that now. Right. So traditional media, no matter what anybody tries to say, is still immensely important. And I, I totally agree with that statement that you just said. You know, for I Feel Like I'm Drowning, you know, we played it on the Colbert show. And then the next week it was number one on all radio. So it's like right. the same. It's yeah. So we didn't get any of that for Pink. Um, so now, finally, after all these months, it's the sales, streams, everything like that are finally starting to pick up more. I think in total, the whole album as a whole has got like was like 75 million, 80 million streams, which is cool. Um, not as good as some of my previous releases. You know, there's like the whole sophomore slump shit and everything like that. But anyway, I was so upset with how it came out that um, in the next eight to 12 weeks following that, from like March till April, May, June, yeah, like March till June about, um, I wrote in a whole another album. And then I, I just recently finished kind of mixing everything and um, yeah, so it's actually done and it's ready to go. I'm in the planning process now. That's part, partly why I came out to LA. Uh, it was super hard to shoot in New York, anything, either music videos to press shots to taking meetings for, you know, when touring might eventually come up for and stuff like that. So I'm finally getting all that together. But yeah, the album's done and uh, ready uh, ready to go. So it sound oh right, sonically, you wanted to know. Sonically, um, yes. Tell us about yeah. the sonic. Uh, I would say it's polar opposite of Pink. I wrote Pink. No way. Um, yeah, I wrote Pink for live shows, really. Like, I wanted an album that could be extended for large, long solos and be more like a Pink Floyd album. And, like, um, so that was written less in mind of, like, having any sort of radio single. Um, you know, with a radio single, you get all this, like, press and stress, and I kind of didn't want to even have to deal with something like that so i just sort of wrote like a jam album um but this next album is like kind of like there's like three really big like in my, like i'm pretty sure like three really really strong singles in there um it's way more vocal centric so they're more everything's more of a song rather than like a lot of guitar based stuff um it still sounds distinctly two feety but it's definitely sort of an, a large evolution from 
honestly all my previous releases. Um, it's more song, just yeah, song based, beat driven, faster paced, stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's still, it, you know, sexy baby making music. Yeah, it is. It's still uh, the lead single um, definitely still has all those vibes. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of drawn to dark sounds and, you know, bass and stuff like that. So th that's all obviously still in there. <laughs> I can't, I couldn't get rid of that in my music if I wanted to, but sonically it definitely evolved in kind of a different, very different direction than the previous music. Do you think of your music, you know, you've had these songs placed in, in TV shows. When you're writing a song, you know, I asked this, we had the score, the band, the score on yeah. two or three right. shows ago. And I talked to them because they've had a lot of songs placed in, in shows and, and movies. And I asked them when they're making a song, do they think of it in terms of could this be played in a in a in a movie or a TV show? And they were kind of like, no, not really. You know, if it if it works out, it works out. What about you? Do you when you're writing a song, do you think like, man, this would be cool in a in a in a movie where something happens? Um, you know what? I, I've had I've had shows reach out to me and ask me to make stuff for them. And it kind of like ruins the creative process. You could be like the new Kenny Loggins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the soundtrack. I know. I know. Yeah, you kind of just think too much about it. I try not to think about it. Um, I feel like my music has a lot of sort of cinematic elements in it already, and um, I think that's why people are drawn to using it for television shows and stuff like that. But now I, I wouldn't say I think about oh, this would be good in this TV show or commercial while I'm writing it. Is that a yeah. new tattoo that what? you have? I don't know. Tell us about your tattoos. Bill has a few tattoos. Yeah. What do you I have do. there? Uh, this Tony is Tony the Tiger on it. Tony the Tiger. Now this is this uh, like a synth oscillator circuit. No um, way. Yeah, it's from when I. Uh, it's like the one that I used to make uh, the bass for "Go Fuck Yourself" on. So I have that. Wow. Um, yeah, and this, you know, then there's just more simple ones. Like I have like an owl because when I was a little kid, I was like, some kids were obsessed with like dinosaurs or cars. I was obsessed with owls. I like knew every owl and like. Wow. Like, yeah, like how owls have like several stomachs and stuff like that. I don't know. I just like loved owls. So I got an owl, and then I have some other a little more personal ones and stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not like covered yet do you, are you are you like are you done or do you plan on getting more close to like the sleeve style you know um definitely it wouldn't be sleeve because if i wanted to go in for a sleeve i would have had to like plan kind of the whole thing out you know what i mean so they sure. kind of do it at once so it'll just be like little like little stories each one but yeah i'm definitely gonna get more in my arm i already have like ideas for the next one i want i want it to be like the address of where i wrote like the first ep and stuff like that so we're gonna play a quick game show before you head out okay come on do it bill all right so um try to answer as quick as you can if the world had to delete something one of the two forever and ever and ever and ever one of these things which would you choose okay are you ready delete guitars or ableton uh, guitars. Ah, uh, Delhi jazz or blues? Jazz. New York or LA? LA. Cream cheese or butter? Cream cheese. Washing machines or dishwashers? Dishwashers. Cardi B or Nicki Minaj? Oh God, Ooh. Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Delete the subway or Uber? Uber. Damn, yeah. delete Britney Spears or the entire world? The entire world. The entire world. Wow. Damn, yeah. Bill. Delete feels like I'm, I feel like I'm drowning or go fuck yourself. I feel like I'm drowning. Nice. You, you won! <laughs> <laughs> go fuck yourself is kind of a strange song because it's not very long. A lot of it's instrumental. So right. how do you feel about playing that live now? Uh, we made it crazy. We like <laughs> This, uh, my friend, uh, Sean, he, he's like, uh, he's Kygo's musical director. He, he made the pedal board for Ed Sheeran. I brought him on like last year to help us kind of extend some of the songs and make them nuts. And he, he helped us make this like insane ending to it. Um, there's like a really good video of it on YouTube of us playing at this like Netherlands festival where you can kind of catch the end of it. Um, that, that song, <laughs> that song kind of like the way it is now, it kind of blows people like away when we do it live. So I, I love that. I love, it's like one of my favorite ones to play live. I mean, it is sort of annoying, you know, 
when you have, I would say I have like three main hits, right? So I have, you know, uh, Go Buck Yourself, which is, you know, 300 something million on Spotify. I feel like I'm drowning 100 something million in Love is a Bitch. And, you know, as we're playing all the other songs from the set, you always hear people yell out one of those three songs, like, the whole time. And it's like, you know, we're going to fucking okay. play it. Like, Calm relax. Down. Yeah, exactly. But I, I love playing Go Fuck Yourself live. I, I mean, I, I don't see us ever taking that out of this set. You know, it's like Radiohead, like, takes out, like, all their biggest hits because he, like, right. time. Well, they've disowned play. Creep. and Yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, like, I, I don't think I'll ever, I don't think I can ever see myself doing that just because it's it's too much fun to play it live. And, uh yeah, I love it. Uh, that was my, that was, that's one of my favorite name drops of all time is name dropping that you have Ed Sheeran's pedal guy. I do, yeah. <laughs> mm. I do. He is the man, um, Sean. He's uh, super brilliant. Uh, he's kind of like a, I wouldn't say he's like a secret, but like I bring him up to other musical directors and not all of them know who he is, but he's just absolutely so brilliant. So What's brilliant. your favorite pedal? My favorite pedal? Yeah. Um... I don't know, just like the basic like uh, tube screamer delay. Like if I have like a little bit of distortion and like, you know, an atmospheric effect, that's all I kind of need. You're not a wah wah yeah. guy. Uh, not really. Some sometimes it depends. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, that's such a specific sound, and it kind of can just like wow wow. Well, like, I I, know. you know, we talked about like jam bands earlier, and I think yeah. I think of jam bands using a wah-wah pedal, so. Yeah, well, they do, but Trey Anastasio, you know, from Fish, like you were saying, I think he uses, like, two tube screamers, like, with different settings, like, both on, whatever, so. Uh, yeah, I think just, like, having, like, a really good distortion is probably better than anything else. Bill, well, we'll let you go. We're, we really appreciate you talking to us. Of course. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bill. Bye, Demi. Bye, Bye. Jordan. See Bye. ya. See ya. See ya. Thank you so much to Two Feet for being on the show. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you for listening to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm Demi Ramos, and you can find me on Instagram at Demi underscore Ramos. And I'm Jordan Edwards. You can find me at jordanedwardsstudio.com or on Instagram at jordanedwardsstudio. Thanks for listening.